Hello YouTube. In this video I'm going to examine an argument against moral anti-realism that's uh, become quite popular in, re in recent years uh, and that's the companions in guilt argument. Uh, um, so uh, I'm assuming that you know what moral anti-realism is, I'm assuming you have a rough idea of the general positions in meta-ethics. If you don't you can go and watch my videos on meta-ethics that I made a few years ago. Uh, so to set up the objection to moral anti-realism uh, we need to consider the motivation for anti-realism. Why does the anti-realist resist moral truth and moral facts? Well, uh, it's because moral facts would have certain objectionable features. Uh, consider, for example, J.L. Mackey's queerness argument. Mackey says, uh, if there were objective values, then they would be entities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. Mackey worries that we can't fit objective moral values into our picture of the world. In particular, what concerns Mackey is that moral values are thought of as being imperative in a categorical sense. Uh, so they're imperative uh, in that they tell us how things should be, what we should do. They give us reasons to act or to refrain from acting. If something is morally good, that's a reason to do it. If something is morally bad, that's a reason not to do it. Uh, now, m moral claims are not the only imperative claims we make, and many imperative claims are perfectly acceptable. Um, so this is because when we talk about having reasons for action in a non-moral sense, we're generally uh, referring only to hypothetical reasons. These have the form, if you want X, then you should do Y, or if you want X, then you ought to do Y. Uh, in this case, we're just supposing that there's some you know, causal connection between uh, Y and X, you know, that Y is the most reliable or perhaps the only way to bring about X. So if you if you want X, then you should do Y, right? And the legitimacy of this imperative depends on X. Without the desire for X, the reason for doing Y disappears. So hypothetical reasons can be reduced to claims about the desires of an agent and then the means of bringing about the satisfaction of those desires. And these are straightforward empirical claims, so there's nothing here that's troubling to a, a moral anti-realist. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm hungry, uh, I desire food, then I have a reason to walk, for, walk to the fridge. My reason for walking to the fridge is conditional on my desire to acquire food. And I can, as it were, release myself from the imperative by changing my desire. It wouldn't make sense to say, you should walk to the fridge, or you ought to walk to the fridge, just in general, right? Like as an imperative that everybody is supposed to follow. No, you should walk to the fridge if you have some goal that will be best achieved by walking to the fridge. Now, moral reasons aren't like this. Moral reasons are categorically or irreducibly imperative, uh, not just hypothetically imperative. Uh, moral facts give us reasons for action that are independent of our desires, interests, goals, uh, independent of our institutional and social arrangements. Uh, the fact that torturing babies is morally wrong provides a reason not to torture babies that does not derive from any desire or convention. I ought not to torture babies, and there is nothing I can do to release myself from this imperative. Even if uh, torturing babies would bring me pleasure, or even if I live in a social group where torturing babies is accepted, I ought not to torture babies. Uh, it's, it's this idea of you know, categorical imperatives, imperatives that are binding no matter what your interests are, that moral anti-realists like Mackey find troubling. Uh, and, you know, there are different ways of spelling out exactly what it is that's supposed to be queer about categorical normativity, but, I mean, you get the general idea. If you've read a bit of meta-ethics, this stuff should be fairly familiar. Now, one of the possible responses to this kind of view is what's known as the companions in guilt argument. Um, and this is developed in a lot of detail in Terence Cuneo's book, The Normative Web. Clearly, the moral anti-realist is not targeting simply moral normativity. Rather, she targets categorical normativity, objective normativity in general. If we accept the queerness argument that I just explained, then we're seemingly committed to anti-realism about all categorical norms. Now the problem, according to the realist, is epistemic facts have the same conceptual profile as moral facts. Epistemic facts would, like moral facts, be categorically normative. Uh, so epistemic facts are facts about what it is reasonable to believe, about what beliefs are 
uh, justified or warranted about what beliefs count as knowledge, what beliefs are well supported by the evidence and so on. So it is reasonable to believe that there are craters on the moon. That is a uh, epistemic fact. Um, telescopic observations of the moon justify the belief that there are craters on the moon. That's another epistemic fact. Uh, it is irrational to believe creationism. Uh, you ought not to believe creationism. Beliefs should be based on evidence. Um, uh, if T1 posits fewer entities than T2, then other things being equal, you ought to believe T1 rather than T2. These are all putative epistemic facts. So uh, moral reasons categorically prescribe certain courses of behaviour. Moral reasons are reasons for action in general. Epistemic reasons are uh, reasons that categorically prescribe particular courses of doxastic behaviour. So this is behaviour with respect to the formation of belief. Epistemic reasons are reasons for belief. So what, why should we believe that epistemic reasons are categorical? Well, let's say we observe smoke above a forest. The smoke above the forest provides a reason to believe that the forest is on fire. And this is the case regardless of any social or psychological contingencies. It's the case regardless of our desires and interests. I may want to believe that the forest is not on fire. Uh, for one thing, it would be much more convenient and comforting for me if I did not face a forest fire. I'd prefer to live in a world without the kind of suffering produced by forest fires. Even so, I have a reason to believe that the forest is on fire. Or suppose I ask, is it rational to believe that the earth is flat? Well, no, it isn't. And when we consider this question, we don't say, you know, we, we don't ask ourselves whether anybody wants to believe that the Earth is flat. Even if you're the leader of a flat Earth group and you would desperately love it to be true that the Earth is flat, it's not rational to believe this. Flat Earth theory is not justified. Uh, there is overwhelming reason to reject it, no matter what your particular interests or goals. So epistemic normativity and epistemic reasons appear to have the same objectionable feature as moral normativity and moral reasons. They're both categorically normative. So I hope you can see the problem here. The moral anti-realist says that the problem with moral reasons is that they are categorically normative. However, if there are no categorically normative reasons, then there are no epistemic reasons uh, either, no reasons for belief. Um, but the objection would then go, epistemic anti-realism is, is absurd and must be rejected. So the argument for moral anti-realism fails. Now, obviously, there are different arguments that a moral anti-realist might use to show that there is something metaphysically or epistemologically problematic about categorical normativity. Um, but, you know, I mean, since epistemic normativity is also categorical, the realist has a very general response. Uh, so if we take some argument X against categorical normativity, then the realist can say, well, you know, if argument X is successful, there are no categorical reasons, but epistemic reasons are categorical. So if argument X is successful, there are, are no epistemic reasons. That should say there are no epistemic reasons there. I obviously left out the word no in, in that. That was a bit of a mistake. But anyway, uh, if argument X is successful, there are no epistemic reasons, but there are epistemic reasons. So argument X is unsuccessful. Putting it even more generally, uh, the companions and guilt argument rests on two fundamental claims. First of all, there's the parity premise, which says that moral facts and epistemic facts are on a par. Whatever objectionable features are attributed to moral facts, we also find in epistemic facts. Uh, and second, the existence premise. There are epistemic facts. And from these premises, it is concluded that the objectionable features do not provide a reason to reject moral facts. So how might the moral anti-realist deal with the companions in guilt argument? Well, one obvious response, which is uh, discussed at length by uh, Cuneo in his book, is to develop epistemic counterparts to uh, moral anti-realist views. Uh, the, the moral anti-realist can hold that there is no categorical normativity, even in the epistemic case, and that epistemic anti-realism is not as implausible as the realist suggests, as the moral realist suggests. Uh, now, just as there are different forms of moral anti-realism, there are different forms of epistemic anti-realism. So we'll discuss uh, a couple of those. One option is the epistemic error theory, or what Cuneo calls epistemic nihilism. And this is the counterpart to the moral error theory. 
Uh, it says that our epistemic judgments express beliefs about epistemic facts, but that there are no epistemic facts, so all epistemic judgments are false. Just as the moral error theorist says that moral judgments express beliefs, but there are no moral facts, so all moral claims are false. The epistemic error theorist uh, grants that epistemic reasons are categorically normative, that an epistemic fact is a fact that entails that there are epistemic reasons for some agent to hold some belief, that epistemic claims are claims about what there are reasons to believe. Um, so there are no epistemic reasons. No belief is justified or warranted or rational or whatever. Uh, it's important to note that the epistemic error theorist does not claim that every judgment of epistemic relevance is false. For one thing, there are facts about truth and falsehood, and attributions of truth and falsehood can be true. So when I say it is true that um, you, you know the, the forest is on fire, that may be true. Um, similarly, that, that there are facts about the reliability of belief forming processes, and some attributions of reliability may be true. It's presumably true that forming beliefs on the basis of perception is more reliable than forming beliefs by consulting a crystal ball. Uh, as a final example, there are facts about the principles we rely on in our reasoning, and some of these principles may be true. For example, induction might require the assumption of the uniformity of nature, and perhaps some forms of the uniformity of nature claim are true. Uh, all of these things are of epistemic relevance, and all of these things are true. So the epistemic error theorist restricts her thesis to uh, direct epistemic judgments to attributions of knowledge, justification, warrant, rationality, things like that. Uh, it's analogous to how various judgments that are relevant to our moral deliberations can be straightforwardly true according to the moral error theorist. So if I ask, is abortion morally wrong? The fact that the fetus is contained inside the woman's body is morally relevant, but it's clearly straightforwardly true that the fetus is contained inside the woman's body. So it's only the, the direct uh, moral judgments, like abortion is wrong or abortion is permissible, that the uh, moral error theorist will uh, say are false. And the same is the case for the epistemic error theorist. OK, so Cuneo raises three objections to the epistemic error theory. And uh, Jonas Olson, in his book Moral Error Theory, responds in favour of epistemic error theory. So we'll review this debate briefly. At first, Cuneo says that the epistemic error theorist faces a dilemma. Either epistemic error theory is self-defeating, or it is, uh, to use Cuneo's phrase, polemically toothless. The epistemic error theorist says that there are no reasons to believe anything. Now, uh, epistemic error theorists can say either that there are reasons to believe epistemic error theory or that they're not. Uh, if they claim that there are reasons to believe epistemic error theory, well, obviously that's self-contradictory because they'd be claiming that there are epistemic reasons to believe that there are no epistemic reasons, and that would be self-defeating. On the other hand, if they hold that there are no reasons to believe epistemic error theory, then their position is toothless in the sense that nobody could be convicted of a rational mistake in rejecting it. Uh, so Olson responds that this simply misses the point of epistemic error theory. Uh, he thinks the epistemic error theorist can happily accept the second horn of this dilemma. Since she is an epistemic error theorist, Olson says, she is not making any claims about what it is rational to believe or about what there is reason to believe or anything like that, so it's perfectly fine for epistemic error theory to be toothless in those debates. Uh, indeed, she thinks that such debates are based on a false presupposition. Olson says we need to distinguish arguments uh, for the claim that P is true from arguments for the claim that it is rational to believe that P, or that there are epistemic reasons to believe that P. The error theorist offers arguments, such as the queerness argument, for the claim that epistemic error theory is true. That's all. This is a claim about what the facts are in you know, meta-epistemology, uh, namely that there are no categorically normative facts, there are no epistemic reasons. But but that's it. It's, it's not a claim about what there are reasons to believe or about what it is rational to believe. One of the problems here, according to Olson, is that the term reason is ambiguous. The error theorist insists there are no categorically normative reasons for belief. But there may well be reasons for belief, or, or at least reasons for some agents to believe some propositions in other senses of the term reason. For example, there are hypothetical reasons for belief. 
Uh, we have already encountered these in the moral domain. An agent has a hypothetical reason to believe that P when the agent has some desire or goal that would be fulfilled were she to believe that P. One obvious goal is the goal of having true beliefs and avoiding false beliefs. Um, you know, particularly pertinent in this case is that we want to have true beliefs about matters concerning uh, you know, epistemology, meta-epistemology, in which case we have hypothetical reason to believe the epistemic error theory, assuming the epistemic error theorists' arguments are sound. Believing the epistemic error theory would satisfy our desire to hold true beliefs. So you know, we have the specification of a desire and the specification of how that desire can be satisfied. There is no problematic normativity here. Let's turn to Cuneo's second objection. Uh, Cuneo says that the epistemic error theorist is committed to a radical epistemological scepticism. If there are no epistemic facts or no epistemic reasons, then no belief can be justified or unjustified, no belief can be warranted or unwarranted, no belief can be rational or irrational. In particular, no belief can count as knowledge. No belief can have any kind of epistemic merit or demerit. Um, and that seems to be a, a wildly sceptical claim. Well, again, uh, Olson responds that this equivocates on the term reason. The epistemic error theorist says there are no irreducibly normative reasons. She's happy to grant hypothetical reasons for belief. We aim to hold true beliefs, and we can provide an argument to the effect that some proposition is true. If the argument is sound, it gives us a hypothetical reason to believe the proposition. And since basically all inquirers share the goal of true belief, we can then criticise others for failing to adopt the belief on the basis of the argument. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's just a hypothetical reason for belief. Um, so that's, that's all we need, according to Olson. All right, Cuneo's third objection is that epistemic error theory implies that there can be no arguments for anything. When we give an argument, we state some premises and a conclusion. The premises are offered as providing evidential support for the conclusion. But this, Cuneo says, is just a matter of the premises being offered as a reason to accept the conclusion. Uh, so since the error theorist denies that there are epistemic reasons, she ends up with the result that there are just no arguments at all. No premises can ever support any conclusion. I mean, clearly the assumption here is that evidential support for P is a matter of having an epistemic reason for believing that P. And I think it is true in colloquial contexts at least that the phrases reason to believe that P and evidence that P are, are used interchangeably. Um, now of course we might be using reason here in the sense of hypothetical reasons which epistemic error theorists are perfectly happy with. So the real question is whether the, the evidential support relation is itself normative. Olson's response basically is, well, there's just no reason to think that it is. Uh, certain methodologies, such as Bayesianism or inference to the best explanation or whatever, will tend to lead to a higher proportion of true to false beliefs. That's a purely descriptive fact. Um, similarly, if an argument is sound, then its conclusion must be true. Uh, and an, an argument is sound when it's logically valid and when its premises are true. Again, these are purely descriptive claims. Um, so you know, that seems to be a case of non-normative evidential support. Um, but this is, is, is an important point, and it's, it's maybe worth exploring this in a bit more detail. So I think what we've seen then is, is that there's a general strategy for the epistemic error theorist, and in fact this is a strategy for, for any kind of epistemic uh, anti-realist. This is a strategy that Olson, I think, is really using in all of his responses to the three objections. And this is the thought that, look, we can account for um, epistemic judgments in general in terms of two things. First, non-normative evidential support relations. And second, the aims that particular agents have with respect to belief formation. Uh, in particular, the aim to maximise true belief and minimise false belief. So this is, you know, basically understanding epistemic judgments in, in terms of uh, hypothetical imperatives. You know, if you want true beliefs, right, then you should adopt those beliefs that are uh, well that that are well supported by the evidence, where evidence can be understood in a non-normative way. Um, so, 
For example, we say that smoke above the forest is a reason for believing that the forest is on fire. Why? Well, because first of all, there's a non-normative evidential support relation between the smoke above the forest and the forests being on fire. And secondly, because we want to maximize true beliefs. So given that we recognize that smoke above the forest is evidence that the forest is on fire, we're inclined to form the belief that the forest is on fire. Uh, yeah, we have reason to believe that the forest is on fire. This is a hypothetical reason. It rests on descriptive facts and the aims of agents. The big question here, obviously, is whether that first condition can be fulfilled. Can evidential support relations actually be understood in a non-normative way? Well, how exactly would this analysis go? One initial idea is to think of evidential support in terms of probability. Smoke above the forest provides evidence for the claim that the forest is on fire because smoke above the forest raises the probability that the forest is on fire. So in general, x evidentially supports y just means that x raises the probability of y, uh, or yeah, the probability of y given x is greater than the probability of y. Is this normative? Well, uh, James Lenman, in his uh, review of Cuneo's book, points out that it doesn't seem to be normative. Um, uh, rather, he says, and I quote, uh, that it is plausible to think of the fact that smoke raises the probability of fire as made true not by anything normative, but rather simply by worldly nomological connections between the presence of one and the presence of the other. Uh, another reason to, to think of probability statements as non-normative is given by Chris Heathwood in his article uh, Moral and Epistemic Open Question Arguments. Consider the limiting case of a probability relation, that of logical entailment. Suppose that Frank is taller than Vincent and Vincent is taller than Bob, well then it's logically guaranteed that Frank is taller than Bob. And I mean if something is logically guaranteed to be true, if something is necessarily true, then it's probably true. Uh, so we have you know, the fact that Frank is taller than Vincent and Vincent is taller than Bob raises the probability that Frank is taller than Bob. Like, you know, what, what makes this true? Why does, it, why does it raise the probability that Frank is taller than Bob? Well, just because Frank's being taller than Vincent and Vincent's being taller than Bob logically entails that Frank is taller than Bob. That seems to be a purely descriptive fact. So we have a kind of evidential support relation and there's no reason to think of that as being normative. And as Heathwood points out, it would be surprising if things worked completely differently for cases where evidence does not entail but merely, merely strongly supports some conclusion. The obvious difficulty with all of this is that any attempt to spell out the non-normative analysis of evidence precisely is going to face various objections. So if we take the identification of evidential support with probability, well that actually faces a whole bunch of counterexamples, at least if we're treating it as you know, a necessary and sufficient analysis of, ev of evidential support. For example, if I am driving my car, this raises the probability that I will die in a car accident. Obviously, though, I wouldn't take the fact that I'm driving to be evidence that I have died in a car accident. Indeed, it's evidence against the claim that I've died in a car accident because I couldn't still be driving if I was dead. Of course, we might wonder just how much the epistemic anti-realist should really be expected to do here. Almost any non-normative analysis of evidence will face counterexamples, yes. But then almost any analysis of evidence in general, right, e even any analysis that treats it as normative, will face counterexamples too. It would surely be unreasonable to demand that the epistemic anti-realist provide a watertight analysis of evidence. It seems like it should be enough for her to point out that non-normative analyses are at least plausible, that the that the non-normative approach to evidential support is a, a, a at least viable research project, um, and it, I, I guess you know we should bear in mind as well there might there might not be like one analysis of evidential support. It may be that it's more like a cluster concept, but that each part of the cluster is non-normative. Um, you know, so uh, we can we shouldn't be uh, demanding too much. Uh, I, I guess of, of the epistemic anti-realist, um, and and the example of how probability can be uh, understood in a non-normative way is, is perhaps enough to show that this is at least a viable project. Okay, one other concern about uh, ep the epistemic error theorists approach is that even if we can understand evidence in a non-normative way, it, it seems like there's still something missing here. So suppose that Frank believes the earth is flat. 
I reproach him for ignoring the many considerations which suggest that his belief is false. And he replies that he agrees that the evidence suggests that his belief is false, but that he, he just doesn't care about having true or false beliefs. And so the considerations I raise don't provide any type of reason for him to drop his belief. This would be a bizarre response, and I think we'd be quite strongly inclined to say that, no, Frank has good reason to drop his belief, even though he doesn't share our, our aims of having true or false beliefs. Like we, we want to say that there is a reason for rejecting the belief that the Earth is flat, no matter what your goals are. Even if Frank doesn't care about truth or falsehood, he's still being irrational, isn't he? But the epistemic error theorist just can't say this. A person who doesn't care about truth and falsehood really does have no reason to be moved by evidential support relations um, and really can't be convicted of irrationality for holding false beliefs, even obviously false beliefs. And perhaps that does seem strange. Maybe the epistemic anti-error uh, theorist can explain why this seems strange, though. Uh, there is, in almost all contexts, widespread agreement on the aim of maximising true beliefs and minimising false ones. We might even take this as being a kind of institutional aim of inquiry in general. So that in order to, in, in order to count as engaging in any kind of inquiry, you have to aim to form true beliefs and avoid false beliefs. Uh, it's similar to how, in order to count as engaging in a chess game, you have to aim to follow the rules of chess. Somebody who moves the pawns diagonally and who moves the bishops in straight lines just isn't playing chess. Um, and somebody like Frank just isn't engaging in inquiry. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that somebody who really just doesn't care about truth and falsehood would even be able to you know, survive or, or make any decisions at all. Um, like, they, I mean, Frank can say, oh, I don't care about truth and falsehood, but then in many other contexts, it would seem that he, he does, right? Like he might want to fly, but he won't just walk out of a window. He'll take the stairs. So, um, so, so the point is, it, it may just be the case that if we're, if we're certainly if we're engaging in any kind of inquiry, and possibly if we're just talking to a normal person who's capable of surviving, then there has to be a shared goal of acquiring true beliefs and avoiding false beliefs. Um, and so actually we're, we're all beholden to the hypothetical imperative, you know, if you want true beliefs, you should believe X. Um, okay, so that was epistemic uh, error theory. Uh, epistemic error theory is not the only anti-realist approach to normativity. There is also epistemic expressivism or epistemic non-cognitivism, uh, which is, of course, the counterpart to moral expressivism. We just apply the ideas of moral expressivism to epistemic language. The claim then is that epistemic judgments are not descriptive or fact stating, but instead express uh, cognitive states. They express attitudes of approval or disapproval or endorsements of particular norms or you know, whatever, things like that. Uh, it, it expresses, they express attitudes. Uh, epistemic judgments do not have a mind to world direction of fit as like, you know, belief does. A belief tries to, you know, fit the way the world is. Uh, rather, epistemic judgments have a world to mind direction of fit. These judgments serve, serve to guide the practice of inquiry, um, just as for the moral expressivist, moral judgments guide social interaction. Uh, anyway, the important point is that since uh, epistemic sentences um, do not express propositions, they are neither true nor false, and we need not be convicted of massive error when passing epistemic judgments. <clears throat> Now, just like epistemic error theory, epistemic expressivism is restricted to uh, direct epistemic judgments, attributions of knowledge, justification, warrant, rationality. Uh, there are many judgments we make that are of epistemic relevance, but that the expressivist will happily grant can be true or false. Judgments of truth and falsehood can themselves be true or false. Judgments of the reliability of belief forming processes can be true or false. Descriptions of how agents actually form beliefs can be true or false, and so on. So, I mean, let's take a specific example here. Uh, suppose that Frank has acquired a true belief P uh, by some method M in circumstances C. It so happens that this method used in these circumstances is, 
let's say 90% reliable. 90% of the beliefs produced by the application of this method in these circumstances are true. Uh, and we may also suppose that Frank has various higher order beliefs about the appropriateness of using M in these circumstances. On this basis, uh, Vincent attributes knowledge to Frank. Vincent says, Frank knows that P. Frank is justified in believing that P, and so on. Now, according to the epistemic expressivist, Vincent's epistemic judgment, Frank knows that P, it doesn't merely report the facts, you know, like the facts that Frank arrived at P by applying M in C, the fact that M in C is 90% reliable and so on. Rather, Vincent's judgment is also used to express a kind of approval of Frank's belief given Frank's epistemic position. To say that Frank knows that P is partly to say that Frank arrived at the belief that P using a method that you approve of. Now, expressivist positions can get quite sophisticated, uh, technically, um, but I don't think we really need to go into those details. There is, uh, according to Cuneo, a problem at the very heart of epistemic expressivism, namely that it has difficulty making sense of second order epistemic judgments. So first order epistemic judgments are judgments such as the belief that P is justified or the belief that P is known, or the belief that P is supported by sufficient evidence, and so on. When I judge that we have sufficient evidence to accept evolution by natural selection, or when I judge that flat earth theory is irrational, these are first order epistemic judgments. Second order epistemic judgments attribute epistemic properties to first order epistemic judgments. So when I judge that P is justified, I may also judge that this judgment itself is justified. Or suppose um, you know, Vincent attributes knowledge to Frank, right? Vincent has said Frank knows that P. I may then judge that Vincent's attribution of knowledge to Frank is justified. So it's an epistemic judgment about an epistemic judgment. That's a second order epistemic judgment. Okay then, so what's wrong with epistemic expressivism? Well, Cuneo says, first of all, Epistemic evaluations apply to a mental state only if that mental state is representational or truth apt. Um, so you know, beliefs are truth apt. Beliefs attempt to describe some state of affairs in the world. We can evaluate beliefs as being true or false. If somebody says the earth is flat, it makes sense to ask whether this is justified or rational or warranted because this purports to represent a state of affairs in the world. But according to the epistemic expressivist, epistemic evaluations are not representational, they're not truth apt. When I say flat earth theory is irrational, I'm expressing an attitude of disapproval. So it would seem that if epistemic expressivism is right, we can't apply epistemic judgments to epistemic judgments. But obviously we do. I mean, I can say not just that flat earth theory is irrational, but also that I am justified in believing that flat earth theory is irrational. Flat Earth theory is irrational is the first order epistemic judgment, and then you know, the belief that Flat Earth theory is irrational is justified, that's the second order epistemic judgment. You know, I am justified in believing that Flat Earth theory is irrational, that's the second order epistemic judgment. It's an epistemic judgment about an epistemic judgment, and that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to say. And indeed, actually, this problem, Cuneo says, generalizes to first order epistemic judgments too, because making a first order epistemic judgment often involves committing yourself to a second order epistemic judgment. When I judge that flat earth theory is irrational, this seems to involve representing myself as being justified in making this judgment. Or similarly, if I argue that there are good reasons to accept the theory of evolution by natural selection, presumably I represent myself as being justified in making this assertion. So, um, <clears throat> To summarise the, the argument, uh, epistemic judgments apply to mental states that are truth apt. Ordinarily, we make epistemic judgments about epistemic judgments, and there's nothing irrational or unreasonable about doing this. Um, so epistemic judgments are truth apt. Um, and as I noted, you can, you can then press the problem by saying that actually it generalises to first order epistemic judgments too. Notice that this is a problem unique to epistemic expressivism. There is no equivalent of 
uh, premise one here in the moral domain. We make moral evaluations not just of mental states that are representational and truth apt, but also of desires, actions, emotions, and so on. So there is no problem under expressivism in meta-ethics about passing second-order moral judgments, making a moral judgment about a moral judgment. This is a problem specific to epistemic expressivism. Is this argument convincing? Well, uh, Clemens Kappel, I may or may not be pronouncing that correctly, uh, in his article, Is Epistemic Expressivism Dialectically Incoherent? Um, actually, I just said his. I don't even know if that's a man. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. I should have checked that, shouldn't I? Uh, so, okay. Sorry. Well, uh, apologies if I'm wrong about that. But anyway, um, he suggests that uh, the epistemic expressivist should simply deny premise one of this argument. Uh, Kappel grants that um, something like premise one seems to be true of first order epistemic judgments, but it's not clear why we should accept it for second order epistemic judgments as well. Why do we make epistemic judgments? Well, the point is to guide, constrain and evaluate our practices of acquiring beliefs. This is why first order epistemic judgments apply to states that are truth apt and why it would seem bizarre to make epistemic judgments of states like desires, emotions or actions. However, Kappel points out that it does not follow from this that epistemic judgments could never apply to non-representational states. According to the, the epistemic expressivist, we use an epistemic judgment to express approval uh, or disapproval of, of beliefs and methods of belief formation with the goal of guiding and evaluating our practices of inquiry. Well, surely then it, it seems very natural that this epistemic judgment would itself be the object of other epistemic judgments, again with the goal of guiding and evaluating our practices of inquiry. Uh, after all, even though um, epistemic judgments may not be representational or truth apt, they do bear a special kind of relation to representational truth apt states. Uh, namely, if it's a first order epistemic judgment, it's going to be specifically about uh, representational truth apt states, and it's going to be about how those uh, representational states should be acquired. So epistemic judgments can themselves be the objects of other epistemic judgments in a relatively straightforward way. The, the, the expressivist should just deny premise one. Um, so maybe that's uh, a, a, a way out of Cuneo's objection. Um, okay then. So uh, we, we, we've seen a couple of uh, examples of epistemic anti-realism. Now, throughout this discussion of epistemic anti-realism, I have been making one potentially problematic assumption. The defense of epistemic anti-realism, whether it is epistemic error theory or epistemic expressivism, is going to involve trying to account for epistemic reasons in terms of hypothetical norms. Norms of the form, if you want X, you ought to do Y. If you want X, you have reason to do Y. So if you want true beliefs, you ought to adopt belief forming processes that reliably produce true beliefs. As we saw at the beginning of this video, moral anti-realists assume that hypothetical normativity is unproblematic. But some philosophers have worried that hypothetical normativity is actually just as queer as categorical normativity. Uh, see Matthew Bedke's article, Might All Normativity Be Queer? Um, that's Matthew Bedke, B-E-D-K-E. -E. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right again. Um, but anyway, if this is right, the anti-realist is in some pretty serious trouble. Uh, it's not obvious how to defend epistemic anti-realism if we can't even appeal to hypothetical imperatives. So why does Bedke think that hypothetical normativity might also be queer. Well, we need to consider the, the, the uh, structure of reasons. So Bedke first begins with an example of a moral reason. He says, imagine you're on a train carriage that is standing room only, and while trying to find space, you settle on a spot where you happen to be standing on a woman's foot, causing her significant pain. Now, the moral realist will say that's morally wrong, and this provides a reason for stepping off her foot, regardless of what your particular interests or desires are. Now, what is it that's queer here? Well, there's nothing queer about pain. There's nothing queer about standing on someone's foot. 
there's nothing queer about the causal relation between standing on someone's foot and their feeling pain. Um, just as an aside, um, Bedke is of course ignoring all of the literature on causation. Uh, many of us actually do find the causal relation problematic, um, but let's just ignore that in this context I guess. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, so there's nothing queer about all of that and there's nothing queer about moving off her foot. What is problematic about morality is that it provides a reason that relates these perfectly standard facts in a special normative kind of way. The fact that your action is causing the woman pain, right, th that fact is a reason to stop doing that action. It counts in favour of stopping the action. In general then, moral reasons have the following kind of structure. F is a reason for A's Xing in circumstances C. The causing of gratuitous pain is a reason for you to step off the woman's foot given the circumstances in the carriage. Um, like given the fact that you have the ability to step off the woman's foot, that nothing is preventing you from stepping off. Um, so uh, none of the terms of this relation are metaphysically queer, right? F, A, X, C, none of those things are queer. What's queer is the relation itself. Now the problem is that hypothetical reasons have the same conceptual structure. Let's say you're hungry, you desire food, and there is food in the fridge. So the easiest way for you to satisfy your desire would be for you to walk to the fridge. Thus you have a reason to walk to the fridge. Your desire for food is a reason for you to walk to the fridge, given your circumstances. And this generates the hypothetical imperatives, like if you desire food, you ought to walk to the fridge, and so on. Now you can see how this fits into this, the conceptual structure just, just described, right? F is the desire, Xing is the means of satisfying the desire. Okay, there are two important points here. First of all, the moral anti-realist says that what's problematic about moral and epistemic reasons is that, is that they are categorical, not dependent on desires. But what we have seen is that what's problematic about moral, moral reasons is not the uh, relater, but the relation itself. And hypothetical normativity exhibits the same relation. Why is the relation any less puzzling when F is a fact about an agent's desires, and X is a way to satisfy the desire. Second, the moral anti-realist argues that we can reduce hypothetical normativity to two things. First, the desires of an agent, and second, the means of bringing about the satisfaction of those desires. But in fact, this simply leaves out the relation between those two things. Uh, so, you know, if we take, right, F is a reason for A's Xing in circumstances C, well, that, that just leaves out the, the is a reason part. Yeah, I mean, we, we've only got the F and the X. It leaves out the fact that F is a reason for X. So there are different lines uh, the anti-realist might take in response to this. Uh, Olson talks about this in his book. As I understand him, he basically just bites the bullet and says that actually the anti-realist can do without hypothetical normativity as well. Uh, we don't ever really have any kind of reasons for action, not even hypothetical reasons for action, um, and that in fact it's you know, the desires of an agent and the means of satisfying those desires are enough, and we really shouldn't think of this in normative terms at all. Um, for those who uh, are not so attracted to such a radical position, uh, we might suggest that the normativity of a hypothetical imperative is in a sense built into the desire itself. So, so actually, F and X are enough to give us the is a reason for content. Uh, so let's contrast the moral and hypothetical cases again. Remember we have the general structure, F is a reason for A's Xing in circumstances C. Well, in the moral case, the causing of gratuitous pain is a reason for you to step off the woman's foot, given your circumstances. Um, and then in the purely self-interested case of hypothetical, uh, norms. Your desire for food is a reason for you to walk to the fridge, given your circumstances. Now, notice that in the moral case, you can in principle have any attitude whatsoever to causing somebody gratuitous pain. You might enjoy it, you might hate it, uh, that's not relevant to the moral reason. You have a reason not to cause gratuitous pain even if you enjoy doing it. Uh, so it's hard to see how the moral reason could in itself provide any motivation for you to stop causing gratuitous pain. Well, now take the second case. If you desire food, then this alone provides a motivation for you to achieve a state in which you have food. 
and this is arguably like analytically true, um, the motivational content is just part of what a desire is by definition. It would be very strange to say that I desire food, but that I have no motivation to acquire the food. The desire uh, is, as it were, pushing you in a certain direction. And this is a sense in which a hypothetical imperative provides a reason for action. And it's, it's certainly a sense which seems to be missing in, uh, in the moral case. Uh, perhaps another way to look at this is to ask the question, like when we when so when we when we have f is a reason for a's xing in circumstances c, what is it that makes f a reason for xing? Well, with hypothetical uh, norms, we can explain this by saying that f is one of your desires, and then like all desires have a motivational force for their bearer. Your desires motivate you. On the other hand it's not clear what we're supposed to appeal to in the moral case. The causing of gratuitous pain is a reason to step off the woman's foot, but I mean the fact that she's experiencing pain will not in itself motivate you to do anything. So contrary to Bedke's claim, we might argue that what's problematic about moral normativity is not simply the conceptual structure of moral reasons. The motivational content of desires is what provides the reason in the hypothetical imperative. Maybe the anti-realist can take a line like that. Um, okay, well, uh, obviously, there is much more that could be said about these epistemic anti-realist views, uh, and there are other forms of epistemic anti-realism that we haven't considered. Uh, but the overall message here is that one obvious way for the moral anti-realist to deal with the companions in guilt argument is just to accept that there are no categorical norms, um, but then hold that this isn't a problem. Uh, unsurprisingly, other responses have been explored too, so we'll move on to those. So one objection to the companions in guilt argument simply denies the parity premise. It denies that moral uh, that the moral anti-realists' objections to categorical moral norms generalise to all norms. Um, so the moral anti-realist can be a realist about epistemic norms. This line is uh, suggested in Richard Joyce's article, Moral and Epistemic Normativity, the guilty and the innocent. Uh, although jo Joyce himself uh, doesn't frame his argument exactly as an objection to the parity of moral and epistemic norms, it can be, I think, used that way. Joyce lists a number of disanalogies between moral normativity and epistemic normativity. First, epistemic norms are compatible with involuntarism in a way that moral norms are not. Moral norms seem to depend on some sort of conception of free will or responsibility that, that might not be coherent or might be non-existent. It's often said in the moral domain, ought implies can. To say that you morally ought to do something implies that you're capable of doing it. Um, and, and yet, as, as we all know, there is a lot of debate about the status of free will. Uh, uh, it, it may be just illusory. <clears throat> maybe we don't really have the kind of control over our actions that we would need in order to uh, provide the basis for moral facts. Um, and this problem doesn't seem to arise with epistemic norms because we all acknowledge that you can't just choose your beliefs. So epistemic norms seem to involve merely the evaluation of a belief. Uh, second, some areas of moral discourse seem to depend on claims that have been refuted. For example, virtue ethics rests on the notion of stable character traits, but human psychology just may not be structured in this way. Uh, this has famously been argued by John Doris in his book Lack of Character. Third, moral normativity involves conceptions of desert. Uh, the idea is that moral transgressions warrant punishment, but the notion of desert is rather mysterious, Joyce thinks. Even if it's a fact that I ought not to kill people, what makes it the case that if I kill someone, then I deserve punishment? There's nothing comparable in the epistemic case. We say that people ought not to form beliefs in certain ways, and we judge certain people to be rational or irrational, but that's all. There's no further conception of desert that we are going to need to account for in the epistemic case. Fourth, there are genealogical debunking arguments for moral norms, such as the evolutionary debunking argument. We can explain the origin of moral thinking in a way that is compatible with, and perhaps even suggestive of, its systematic falsehood. Uh, Joyce thinks that there is nothing comparable for epistemic norms. Fifth, and I think most significantly, the prospects for naturalising epistemic normativity are brighter than for moral normativity. 
Uh, Joyce thinks that reductionist accounts of epistemic norms have better prospects than the same accounts of moral norms. Uh, so with respect to reducing epistemic norms, an interesting point has been raised by Heathwood in his article Moral and Epistemic Open Question Arguments. Recall Moore's open question argument against moral naturalism. Moore tries to show that every analysis of a moral concept like good in terms of natural properties uh, will be clearly defective. Suppose, for example, that we were to define goodness in terms of pleasure. So good just means maximises pleasure or something along those lines. Now, consider the statement. Uh, this is something that maximises pleasure, but it isn't good. Well, we have the strong intuition that this is not self-contradictory. This statement seems like a perfectly coherent thing to say. Um, you know, I mean, we, you might disagree with it, right? But uh, you might think that, okay, the good just is whatever maximises pleasure. But the point is, is that somebody who uses this, it seems, is expressing like you know, a moral belief. They're expressing a belief about what goodness is uh, or expressing an attitude about what goodness is. Um, and it looks like a disagreement about what goodness is. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be incoherent. And this suggests that goodness can't simply be identified with what maximizes pleasure. Because if the concept of goodness were just the concept of pleasure, then saying that something maximizes pleasure but it's not good would be nonsensical. But this statement surely isn't nonsensical. It's surely not nonsensical to say this is something that maximizes pleasure but it's not good. At the very least, it seems like something we can have a reasonable disagreement about. Um, and the same would be the case, Moore suggests, no matter what natural property we plug into the first part of this statement. Um, you know, no matter, so this is something that is X, but it's not good. Moore thinks that whatever property we substitute for X, we're going to run into the same point, in, into the same problem, that it, this statement will not be self-contradictory. And so we can't naturalize morality. We can't reduce moral normativity to natural properties. Now, obviously, there's a great deal of debate about this argument. Um, there are plenty of moral naturalists out there who think that this argument can be overcome. Um, but the point is, moral naturalism does face various problems, one of which is that many people worry that moral naturalism just kind of misses the point of morality. And I think that that is... That, that's a worry that seems to be captured by Moore's open question argument. Um, you can check out my video on moral non-naturalism, where I discuss the open question argument in more detail if you're interested in exploring this further. Uh, but let's move on uh, and consider epistemic normativity. So as an initial example, Heathwood suggests that we define epistemic normativity in terms of probability, as we did earlier. Uh, so uh, P is reasonable to believe just means P is probable given our evidence. Well, now consider the statement. This is probable given my evidence, but it's not reasonable for me to believe it. Is this self-contradictory? Well, it could be. It does seem to verge on incoherence. Somebody who utters, for example, it's probably true that there is a table in front of me, but I don't believe that there's a table in front of me. We would wonder if, if they understood what they were saying. Um, at any rate, we certainly don't have any, any intuition that it's not self-contradictory, as we do in the case of identifying goodness with a natural property. Um, now, th there are bound to be technical problems with this specific identification of reasonableness with probability, but, you know, the point is just, right off the bat, it, it seems like naturalising epistemic concepts is not as counterintuitive as naturalising moral concepts. Um, you know, nat naturalizing epistemic concepts therefore seems to have brighter prospects. Um, now, so we've seen we've seen these five problems with moral norms. Not all conceptions of morality have all of these problems. Uh, the second point concerning character traits is only a problem for virtue ethics. The third point about dessert uh, surely wouldn't trouble a utilitarian because utilitarians don't treat dessert as a foundational moral concept. Joyce's overall point here is just that. While categorical normativity in general is problematic, moral norms seem to have a number of objectionable features beyond this. Uh, the 
you know, the the, more, the, the, the the epistemological and metaphysical puzzles about categorical normativity, uh, that, that's kind of just one part of the argument for moral anti-realism. Um, and it's only when we consider categorical normativity in addition to these other features that the case for moral anti-realism becomes really persuasive, Joyce, or so Joyce says. Uh, but certainly we can't simply treat moral norms and epistemic norms as being on a par. Uh, moral norms do have these additional problems, which makes it much more difficult to uh, so, sort of treat them as being normative, uh, treat, treat that normativity as being a fact of the matter. Okay, uh, an interesting objection to the Companions in Guilt argument has been presented by Christopher Cowie in his article, Why Companions in Guilt Arguments Won't Work. Recall that the argument can be viewed as resting on two premises. The parity premise, which says that moral and ep moral facts and epistemic facts are on a par, so if the arguments for moral anti-realism succeed, then arguments for epistemic anti-realism succeed. And the existence premise, which says that epistemic facts exist, so epistemic anti-realism is false. Um, Cowie constructs a dilemma for the companions in guilt argument, based on what he calls the objection from disparity and the objection from redundancy. Uh, I quote Cowie here, he says, either A, the objection from disparity undermines the parity premise, and hence the companions in guilt argument, or B, the objection from redundancy renders the companions in guilt argument dialectically redundant. Basically, Cowie objects that typical arguments for the existence premise undermine the parity premise, and those that do not will render the companions in guilt argument dialectically redundant. So let's begin with this objection from disparity and the arguments <clears throat> for the existence premise and take a typical argument for the existence premise, for the premise that there are epistemic facts. We've already seen several such arguments um, from Terence Cuneo against the epistemic error theory earlier. For example, Cuneo argued that the epistemic error theory is self-defeating. If the epistemic error theory is true, then there are no epistemic reasons for belief. But if there are no epistemic reasons for belief, then there is no epistemic reason to believe the error theory. The trouble, Cowie says, is that if this self-defeat argument is successful, then we have reason to reject the parity premise. And this is because the self-defeat argument, if successful, shows that there is sufficient reason to reject the epistemic error theory. But the moral analogue of this argument would not show that there is sufficient reason for rejecting the moral error theory. So from the moral error theory, <clears throat> It follows that there are no moral reasons, that nothing is morally good or bad, but it doesn't follow that there are no epistemic reasons. The truth of the moral error theory is compatible with the existence of reasons to believe that theory. So there is a reason for rejecting the epistemic error theory that is not a reason for rejecting the moral error theory. And this shows, Cowie thinks, that moral and epistemic norms are actually not on a par. So this is Cowie's objection from disparity. So I guess, I guess speaking more generally here, what all arguments for the existence premise try to show is that epistemic facts have a certain special property, a property that warrants rejecting the epistemic error theory. And this property might be the self-defeating nature of denying the existence of epistemic facts. That's the special property that epistemic facts have. Um, but this doesn't entail that epistemic facts are you know, metaphysically and epistemologically unproblematic, right? It just shows they have a special property which kind of forces us to postulate their existence. Moral facts, on the other hand, do not possess this special property. And so the Companions in Guilt argument doesn't help to support their existence. Um, you know, they have the, the problematic features, but not the special property. Uh, I guess another way to put this point is that categorical normativity is problematic. Right, so that there's good reason not to postulate facts which have this property of categorical normativity. The self-defeat argument shows that we are forced to postulate epistemic facts because epistemic facts have another special property which makes it self-defeating to deny them. And that obviously outweighs the problems of categorical normativity. But for moral facts, there is nothing to outweigh the problems of categorical normativity. So they're not really on a par. Is this convincing? Well, one obvious worry here is that it seems like one of the like one point of the Companions and Guilt argument is precisely that properties thought to be problematic are not really problematic. 
The moral anti-realist says that categorical normativity is an objectionable feature. But then it turns out that epistemic facts, which the moral an which uh, moral realists say all of us have to accept, also have categorical normativity. Now the question is, why would it be problematic to postulate categorical normativity in the moral case if we already have to postulate it in the epistemic case? Um, uh, that seems to be the message of the Companions in Guilt argument. Now, of course, Cowie seems to be right that the arguments for the existence premise show that there is a reason to postulate epistemic facts that is not a reason to postulate moral facts. In that sense, moral and epistemic facts are not on a par. But it's not really clear that this is relevant. The point of the parity premise is rather that the objectionable features of moral facts are shared with epistemic facts. And nothing in the argument for the existence premise undermines this claim, right? I mean, it, we're, we're accepting that both moral facts and epistemic facts are categorically normative. That's the objectionable feature, and they are indeed shared, right? That seems, that's what the parity premise is saying. So the defender of the Companions and Guilt argument might worry that Cowie has missed the point. Um, anyway, um, uh, even if that objection to Cowie's argument doesn't work, uh, Cowie himself admits that um, sometimes the objection from disparity fails. Some arguments for the existence premise do not undermine the parity between moral and epistemic norms. Again, we've already seen one of these from Cuneo, namely the argument from epistemic merits and demerits. If there are no epistemic facts, there are no epistemic merits or demerits, but clearly there are epistemic merits and demerits, or so Cuneo suggests. It's just obvious that believing flat earth theory, for example, is irrational. So there are epistemic facts, and hence the existence premise is true. The objection from disparity fails in this case because the moral realist can construct an analogous argument for moral realism. It goes like this. If there are no moral facts, then there are no moral merits or demerits, but there are moral merits and demerits. It's just obvious that torturing babies for fun is morally wrong. Uh, so there are moral facts. So we have an analogous argument, and the parity premise stands. Here, however, the companions in guilt argument faces the objection from redundancy. This is because the objection from disparity fails only because we can appeal to a more direct argument in favour of moral realism. You know, namely this argument here, that if there are no moral facts, no moral merits, demerits, etc. Um, the Companions in Begilt argument becomes dialectically redundant. We, we can accept the parity premise only if we already have a direct argument for moral realism. Now, um, so, uh, Cowie has pointed only to some specific examples of how uh, of, of the sort of arguments that are used for the parity and existence premises. But he then generalises his critique. He tries to show the Companions and Guilt argument can't work no matter what arguments are used to support it. So, take some arbitrary argument X for the existence premise. Then Cowie says, and I quote, either X has an analogue, call it X star, that provides a sufficient reason for thinking that moral facts exist, or it does not. If it does not, then the parity premise, and hence the Companions and Guilt argument, is undermined via the objection from disparity. So if no such analogue argument exists, then we can't treat moral facts and epistemic facts as being on a par. There are reasons to accept epistemic facts that do not apply to moral facts. Uh, on the other hand, if it does have such an analogue, if, if there is such an X star, then X star is itself enough to show that moral facts exist. We won't need the Companions and Guilt argument anymore. So it falls to the objection from redundancy. Okay, um, well, I think that I think that's all. Yes, that's all for today. Um, I'm aware that there's uh, you know a lot a lot more that could be said about uh, all of the things I've talked about in this in this video, but uh, hopefully that will give you something to chew on. Goodbye.